series called Shift. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? All right. So we are going to wrap up uh, this week, uh, this, uh, this message series this week called The Rule of Life. I'm going to jump right in the value of the rule of life. My favorite band right there, folks. You too. Probably, if not the most successful rock and roll band in all of history. Debatable? Not, not really. They are also followers of Jesus. Maybe you know that, maybe you don't know that for a lot of different reasons. Um, but they became followers of Jesus when a charismatic revival uh, really happened in the UK. Uh, those folks uh, over the pond over there um, back in the late 70s. And it really impacted their youth group uh, that they were attending at the time. And their hearts have been with Jesus ever since. But as I shared in the very first message in this series, you might not know this, but they almost did not record a single album. Do you know why? <laughs> well, the guy over there on the right that always wears the hat, the Edge, okay, um, he was actually going to quit the band before they got a start because he felt the call to be a missionary, to be a Christian missionary, much like, like Adam was just talking about. And it happened right before the first album was to be created. Bono, who, as you can probably understand, is a bit influential, even back then, finally convinced The Edge just to record the first album with them. And sure enough, he did that. And as they always say, the rest they say is what? It's history. They have been so successful in ways and serving and benefiting the poor in ways that really unlike me, any other band. They have worked with Amnesty International, fighting global, uh, global poverty, injustice. Um, it's left a huge impact on, on others, but also on them. In 1986, as I mentioned way back 10 weeks ago, uh, Bono traveled to Ethiopia with maybe a ministry that some of you support, uh, World Vision, and he sat down and he penned the words to the song, Where the Streets Have No Name, due to being so moved by the people in the poor African village in which he was serving. And according to Bono, it's actually a prayer. It's a prayer where the streets have no name, where heaven, praying that heaven would come down right to earth in that little, little village. And about that time that Bono wrote those words, it really kind of, those words is what kind of springboarded, springboarded, you know, this whole, this whole series for me and my own spiritual journey over the last eight to ten years. His quote is, Early on in his life and ministry, Bono's, I can't change the world, but I can change the world inside of me. I can't change the world. Back then, he looked at poverty. He looked at injustice. He looked at all of the, the uh, inequality all the way throughout and gender and generations and countries, all the different things going on. And he penned these words, I can't change the world, but I at least can try to change the world inside of me, this whole idea of a little bit of heaven coming into my heart and to my soul. And then he devoted, of course, after this quote, he divided, devoted his entire life to making the world inside of him a place where a little bit of heaven can touch earth, doing incredible work, all kinds of nonprofit ministries, working with bishops and church leaders throughout the decades, meeting with uh, the, some of the heads of states, our presidents, trying to help alleviate some poverty, bringing a little bit of heaven to earth in the name of Jesus. He's given his really his life mission, if you know anything about Bono, to the kingdom of God using his platform and you 2s platform to do this, to simply change the world, but especially changing the world inside of me. Fast forward to about two years ago, he put out a little book. It's his memoir called Surrender. A little bit older. <laughs> and um, it was published about two years ago. And I read these words in the book. His previous words, I can't change the world, but I can change the world inside of me. After decades of ministry, he's learned, I can actually change the world, but I can't change the world inside of me. And the second half of life, now that I'm nearing 60, those words really resonate with me. He goes on to write, serving and helping the poor. This is the easy part of being an apprentice, a follower of Jesus. The real battle, the real battle, the place that is along the deepest journey along this narrow way, that invisible world inside of me. 
For him, it's his propensity to drink a little too much. Or the many years away from his family and his home life traveling. (laughs) It's this internal battle that he's found to be the most difficult, wondering if he was a good enough husband, a good enough father for his kids, being away for so many, so many months at a time. (laughs) See, I can't change the world, but I can change the world inside of me. Change for him is I can change the world. It's changing the world inside of me that's the real battle. (laughs) And I was thinking about this as I end this series, and this important series. In my over 38 years now of being a follower of Jesus Christ, and just a little over 30 years of total ministry, I'm not that old, but I am. My body reminds me every day. I get what he's saying. It's the internal battle that's truly the most difficult for all of us. My patterns, my habits, the way I learned to respond to stress, my tendency over the years to not be present because I was always looking forward and the next goal, the next hill to take in in my situation, the next hill, the next goal for Jesus and ministry. Thinking back of the past pain in my life that I was completely oblivious to, But so much impacted the man I was and even is in this day. So much of of who I am still to this day. But thankfully, God's not done working through me and in me. So I look back in my own life and I realize I dropped my net at 18 in college. (laughs) While smoking a cigarette, Marlboro cigarette, (laughs) drinking a little King beer in the seventh floor of Wilkins Lounge about 3 o'clock in the morning on a day right around this time of the year in 1986. I dropped my net, and I made a prayer and a pact to follow Jesus. A few years after that, and I knew right away that I wanted to give my life to serve Jesus. What I've learned, I've gone through ups and downs and battles and people and difficult situations and all of that. The real battle isn't out there. The real battle's here. I can't change the world, but I can change the world inside of me. But as you grow older, you begin to realize, actually, I can change the world. It's really hard to change me, and I wrestle with this. And I've come to the peace and the shalom and the conclusion that I'll wrestle with this until the day that I pass from this life to the next. And my guess is many of you, and I hope all of you, know what I'm talking about. And so as we finish this series called Shift, and really this series and much of what I've been discussing this whole year has really covered this inner world soul transformation, spiritual formation, to be with Jesus, to become more like Jesus, to even do some of the things that Jesus did. This is the core of historical Christianity. And so we've taken a look at a lot of different things, a lot of different things over these last 10 weeks, some core practices, not all of them, but these are some of the core practices of of the ways of Jesus. His easy yoke is through, through silence and solitude, prayer, Sabbath, community, um, scripture, and, and serving, all of these talking in depthly. And if you've missed, because this is just life now, and, and no, no guilt, no shame, life is busy. Lots of you do lots of different things to be the best parents, the best people you can be. Keep at it. That's why I'm so thankful for the digital option. But I encourage you, because I'm not going to review. I don't have time for that. But I've all tried to lay out, actually throughout this entire year, about these key things. And so what I want to jump to today in my time remaining is this whole idea of a rule of life. A rule of life. Because to live out this way, in the core practices of Jesus, to change you from the inside out, takes a lot more than just trying harder. It takes a lot more than just trying harder. It takes a commitment What Tyler Statton talks about in one of his little books on prayer is a vow, so to speak, or what has been known throughout Christian history for 2,000 years is a rule of life, something I didn't even know about. Trained in ministry, going to seminary, and it's been there all along. And so what I want to do today is talk briefly about the what and the why and just touch briefly upon the how. What is a rule of life and why do we need it? That brings me to my passage this morning. 
John's disciples came and asked Jesus, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often? Okay, And, and one can argue Jesus did too. And his followers did. That's one of those core practices we just haven't had time to talk about. And I'm going to be honest, part of it is because I'm still working on that part of my life. My, my value is I won't do teaching on something until I feel like I'm authentically at a place where I can do that because I've been practicing or living it, not perfectly, but at least with some level of let me share with you through my failures and my, my growth in that area. And that's one of those, obviously, I have to keep working on. But he asked, they asked, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but you and your disciples do not fast? So back then they weren't fasting like all the Pharisees, even John the Baptist's disciples. And Jesus answered them, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they can fast, okay? But no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on old garment, for the patch will actually pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. And he goes on to say, neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour a new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. And I don't have the time to go into this deeply. (laughs) But it's a way of a first century rabbi teaching about God doing new things. All throughout church history, all throughout even the Old Testament, God is a God who is alive and is always doing new things in his people's lives. And at this time, it's Jesus' way when when these, these, these genuine followers of John the Baptist were asking about the way of Jesus. We're watching your life. It's their way of saying, we're seeing that you practice some things differently. We like your vision. We like your teaching. What's it like? And Jesus is basically saying, this is going to be a new thing. You can't take a, a new patch and put it on old garment. Trust me, I've tried that. I should have brought them, but I threw them out finally after 10 or 12 years. You ever have a, you ever have a favorite pair of shorts that you just love to wear? You know, I had one for 10 years, loved them, but then for whatever reason, I got holes by the pockets on my gluteus maximus. But these these cool things called patches you can buy, and yes, I bought them from Target or Walmart, and I actually used an iron and patched them. Donna was looking at me like, what are you doing? We have the money. Go out and spend $18 for a new pair of shorts. And I'm like, honey, you don't understand. These are my favorite What? Shorts, don't judge me. You've all done it. I know you have, okay? But what happened? You can't put the new patch on the old garment or on the old rear because sure enough, they just kept on breaking, kept on breaking. So I had a memorial service and got rid of them a couple of years ago, or a couple of weeks ago, excuse me. The same thing with wine. And he's just saying this is all about, it's something new. God's doing something new. But see, they're asking about his practices, Jesus' way of approaching his spiritual life. They were were looking and they were seeing something incredible. And though they were followers of John the Baptist, they're like, we want what you have. And so that's how he kind of explained it to them. It's going to be something new, something different. So important that we understand what God is doing in our time with the proper container to hold the blessing of the work of God in today as well. That's why you look throughout church history and you'll see new movements, new growths, new works of God. And oftentimes when you try to typically take the new work and put it in old containers, it does not work. I can give you example after example of example of that. But I don't want to bore you. Here's my point. This is not some... You know, oftentimes you'll see the, in the Gospels, they'll talk about people who were figures trying to stump Jesus. These were genuine followers of John the Baptist. They're just asking, what does it mean to apprentice under you versus John? What are your practices? What are your vows? What, are you, what is your rule of life? It's kind of like asking, what is your vision? And what are you teaching? And how are the practices to get there? And a lot of what a rule of life is, is like vows, Those of you married, remember your special day? For Don and I, it was 33 years ago, and now I'm the youth room. And we got married in the old, you know, uh, worship center here at E-Free, June 1st, 1991. (laughs) 
And when you're at that point, and, and we, we, I do a lot of weddings, a lot of marriages, and the funny thing I always have to tell them is, like, we, I've done everything now in these different services, but as a legally ordained pastor, I only have one requirement to sign that certificate of marriage. You have to have a vow. You can do anything else, and people, trust me, have done all kinds of things, but you have to have a vow. And what the vow is, is it's a vow because oftentimes at this state of love, you are in love. You love me. I love you. We are so in love. So why in the world would you formalize something so passionate and so organic like love with something is so old school and drab like a vow? Why? I'm glad you asked. Because to live out a vision continuously like marital love like the fire of love that might be alive in your hearts today as you make your vows, requires a vow for the inevitable ups and downs and daily grinds or even times where you don't want to stay married. Many times, life can squelch the fire of love. Vows hold the vows in a container for that love. I've been using this quote a lot from uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who's becoming more relevant and relevant, in, in my opinion, for lots of reasons I won't go into today. But today, he sold this to a young couple he was married one time. Today, you are young and very much in love, and you think your love can sustain your marriage. I love this. It can't. Let me say that again. You think your love can sustain your marriage. Your love. No, it can't. Let your marriage, the commitment, the vows sustain, and it will produce those moments. That's a rule of life. That's a vow. The fire of love is wonderful, but at times and over time, the fire can diminish, and that's when you need a vow, a container to hold a vision so that the love can flourish. David Brooks, a journalist who became a Christian a few years back, writes it this way, falling in love with something or someone and building a structure of behavior around it for those moments where love falters. That's another way of saying kind of a rule of life. To live a vision for life requires a continual vow, a rule of life. Now, very important. Every rule of life, every vow, every commitment we make to God is always, always, always a response to the covenant of love that God has made first with us through Jesus Christ. Every expression of love we offer back to God, every spiritual discipline, every spiritual practice we offer in love to God because he first loved us. It's never to earn our way to God. It's never to, to prove ourselves to God. It's simply a response to his love, in love to him. And all throughout Scripture, there are vows. Again, I can bore you to death. Old Testament, Nazarene vows, the priestly vows, the different types of priestly vows, the different errors and the different, all these things I've tried to look up and take a look at. Even the Apostle Paul had a vow. Okay, even the, the biggest proponent of grace and, and really the, the eliminator of legalism as best as he could, as, as there ever was, made vows a rule of life to God. It simply means by which we give God, it's the means by which we give God the only thing we can give him, which is more of our souls, more of our inner lives, to work out the transformation with the Holy Spirit and partnering with him. And that's where disciplines, that's where these practices come into play. I wrote down for myself, I'll share it with you, a vow or rule of life is never a means to make God love me more or to prove my commitment to him. <laughs> that was one of my inner things that had to change. I didn't know, but it, unintentionally, in some ways unknowingly to me, because of some deep wounding in my life, proving myself in life and to God was something that was an inner struggle that I didn't even know. <laughs> So you have to understand how important this is to me more than ever, to know that it's never a means to make God love me more or prove myself to God. There's nothing left to prove. We just sang it. I know who I am. I know who I am. Thank you, Brandon and Katrina, for leading in us in that important song. 
Love is always the motivator, not fear, that drives the practices and the rule of life for the follower of Jesus Christ. Another way to think of a rule of life, the change to, to this inner transformation, is, is it's how we learn to live in the promised land where we've all grown up in Egypt. <laughs> Your rule of life, and I'll go through this in a second, the how and what mine looks like to give you an idea of how we grow in the promised land when we have been trained and thoroughly formed, <laughs> metaphorically, in Egypt. Today, I would say the West, for better, for worse. <laughs> and so, so in reality, this ancient practice of a rule of life, like a vow, is the container that we can allow the vision of being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, to flourish in you and in me. It is how we live out this vision in our lives so that in turn, Jesus can transform us into his image. This is the the why. This is really the why behind all of this. You know, we've talked a lot around here the last couple of years around orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And I brought this up because I I really humbly believe that a lot of our modern-day contemporary Christianity is really based on on really orthodoxy. What we believe justifies us with God, which is in part true. We're only justified by the death and the resurrection by believing in Jesus Christ, okay? But that leads not only to a cognitive understanding of faith, it ought to lead to a deep transformation based on that truth so that our way of life is changed, so that we can experience our our true life, the abundant life that Jesus is calling each of us to, each and every one of his followers. We need a balance of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. As a matter of fact, what I've learned over the last couple of years is that ultimately every church, almost every movement throughout all traditions, throughout all of church history, have always had a statement of faith. You go to a church like ours, and and sometimes you might ask, what's your statement of faith? That statement of faith, what do you believe cognitively about Jesus, about God, about the church, whatever the, you know, and and sure enough, that statement of faith, it's always been there. But did you know up until just the last couple of hundred years, there was always a statement for life? A belief that a community said, this is the way and this is the practices we take on as a community to live the life of Jesus. I'm not surprised, but those have become fallen by the wayside. And as a result, you're seeing more and more division amongst Christians on simple statements of what they believe cognitively. And we don't even talk enough about the way that we live. Which James says, you know, you show me your faith by what you believe. I'll show you a faith by what I do. And that's why early on, you, m- many of you know this, some of you have been around churches for a long time, the, the movement of Jesus was first called, wasn't called the church, it was called the followers of the what? Of the way. Because these people were so odd, they were so countercultural, they were, they were so different than the rest of the world. Because they were living out this easy yoke of Jesus. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you. Fishers of men, come follow me, and my yoke is easy and it's light. You will find rest for your what? Your souls. Which how many of us here need that? And they were called followers of the way, and, and, and they just they really were kind of dismissed. And it gets me, I was thinking, a belief without practice does not re, belief without practice does not result in a true life. Life to the full. But neither is practice without belief. It is both orthodoxy and orthopraxy that are needed to be wedded. You can be drawn to Jesus' teachings, formulating into a doctrine, but your life can be more shaped by American culture than Jesus of Nazareth. And I see this all the time. They want the kingdom, but not the king. And the same can be said for the opposite, where they want all the practices and not the belief. But when Jesus said it this way, I am the way and the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's like he's saying, he's trying to put this equation, the way I put it in my, for my simple mind, because he goes on to say, if you really knew me, you know the Father as well. From now on, you do, you do know him, and you have seen him. Jesus incarnate is the fullest, most clear expression of if you want to know what God the Father is like, it is Jesus. And a proper hermeneutic of understanding the rest of Scripture is through the life and the teachings and the life of Jesus. 
And what he's saying in this verse, especially in, uh, in verse 6, what he's saying is this. The way of Jesus, the practices, core practices of Jesus, plus the believing in the truth of Jesus equals the full abundant life of Jesus. There it is. And I wish I would have learned this 30 years ago. And the question becomes, and this is what I'm trying to get to, the why behind all this, is so then how do you hold these two things together? The way and the truth. It's not either or. And when you overemphasize one over the other, truth is intention, held intention. So how do you hold these two together, orthodoxy and orthopraxy, by not just celebra- uh, celebrating allegiance to Jesus through truth claims and doctrines, which is what a lot of Christ followers do these days, I did for many years, but instead aligning our lives in such a way, in such a way to be with him, to become more, or like him. That's the value of the rule of life. It brings those two together. A rule of life. And you've heard me talk about this before. Those of you who've been exposed to emotional, healthy spirituality relationships, we, we've used the, the imagery of a trellis. The word for rule actually comes from structure, a trellis. And we've talked about that before, much like grapevines. If you go to a Mackinac, the great wine country over there, you go anywhere in the world, the vines, grapes will always, always develop on vines, okay? They will develop. But the, when they're left without a structure, they're minimized because of the, they, they'll be eaten by animals, they'll be diseased, all kinds of things will happen to them. But if you put them on vines, they can grow up and you will bear, they will bear much more fruit. And that's the imagery in which Jesus really hits home when he says, abide in me. If you abide in me, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. We need a rule of life. That's the value. Tyler Stanton in his book on prayer uh, praying like fools, living like monks, I think is what it's actually entitled. I might be wrong, but he talks about using the imagery of an anchor. If you're anybody here a boat person? Anybody here a boat person? I love the imagery of an anchor too. The anchor of a rule of life is simply you put that puppy down and you don't even feel that it's even there. You don't feel it until you begin to drift. And then it tugs at you. And it reminds you. <laughs> Andy Crouch, another pastor, writes it this way. A rule of life is a set of practices to guard our habits and to guide our lives. It is a, a rule of life is, a, is, is simply a set of practices to guard our habits and to guide our lives. I just love that right there. Now, here's what I want you to do. Close your eyes. Seriously, close your eyes. Don't fall asleep on me, though. Close your eyes. And I want you to think, imagine a person or a few people in your life that you admire the most. Imagine a person that you admire the most. Someone like when you're with them, they bring out the best in you. What is it about that person? What does your presence with you communicate to you? What does their life say to you? Keep your eyes closed. Now picture yourself at 80. A few of you, it might be 90. Who do you want to be when you're 80? How do you want people to feel when they've been around you? Your grown kids? Grandkids, maybe even great grandkids. What does your presence communicate? What do you want your life to say about you? Because it will happen faster than you think. Then here's the question Is how you're living today getting you to where you want to go? Forming you who you want to become is how you're living life today getting you to this picture of your life. Where is your current path taking you? You can open up your eyes now. That path is a rule of life. We're all being formed. I've talked on this many times. There is no moment in your life where you're not being formed. 
You're being formed right now. You are under some teaching right now. You're hearing some stuff about the word of God, about practicality, about church history. Hopefully forming you into desiring, wanting a rule of life to love God and love others better. You're always being formed. There's no, there is intentional formation and there is unintentional formation. There is no such thing as neutral. The reality is this, you already have a rule of life. You already do. You're living it. How you spend your mornings when you wake up for the first 5, 10, 15 minutes, how you spend the rest of your day, what you watch, what you listen to, what you read, the people you interact with, on a regular basis, you are a formation animal, whether you realize it or not. There is either unintentional formation or there is intentional formation. The question is not do you have then a rule of life. The question is do you even know what your rule of life is? How you respond to stress, your addictions, your internal processing, what you think about, what you choose to think about. Every moment of every day is a rule of life. The question is, do you know what your rule of life is? How you eat lunch, what you eat, dinner. <laughs> One of mine that I'm so frustrating is, why is it at 9 o'clock at night, when everybody kind of goes to bed, that I like to snack on food? That's a rule of life of mine. I try to choose healthy. I try to believe that frosted shredded wheat, because it has shredded wheat, is healthy, but it's frosted. And if I'm really honest and transparent with you all, I take the little sugar side and I put it on my tongue first. Because it's sweet. There's one of my rules of life. Unintentional, intentional. But in all of that, all, is your rule of life getting you to where you want to go? I mean it. When, what's the kind of person you want to be? I want to passionately be a lot more like Jesus and a lot less like Rick Wagner. I want to be a lot more like Jesus. I want to love people like Jesus. I want to pray for people like Jesus. I want to, when, when people are with me, that they feel valuable and loved and cared for. I want to help people point people to the life of Jesus. I want my wife to know that I love her and believe in her more than ever after 33 years of marriage. I am enjoying my time with her, looking forward to our future, whatever that holds, whatever that looks like. I want my kids to know they can come to me for anything. They can talk to me about anything, even the hard stuff, the stuff that I might not agree with them on. I want my granddaughter to know that she is the best, okay? You might think it's your grandkids. I am sorry. It is my granddaughter. And I want to know that Papa loves her. The other day, Donna was getting out of the car. We had a little date with her to the park. Donna's getting Adeline out of the car, and she looked at Gaga, and she says, Gaga, she goes, yes, honey. She goes, Pop-Up's the best. <laughs> to which Donna then said, well, what about Gaga? Oh, yeah, you too. <laughs> I promised Donna I would not bring that up. <clears throat> but that's my rule of life. Because you got to laugh, too. Is your rule of life, what you're doing in your life, getting you to where you want to be? You see how powerful this is? Your prefer way of life. And that is my pastor's heart and desire. is to help you become the very best version of you in Jesus. And it only happens if Jesus gets more of more into your life, embedded in your heart and your soul. That's been the difference for me these last eight to ten years. Long way to go. But that's why a rule of life is so important, an intentional one. And we've hit, this spring, I spent weeks talking about this to the point, some people were saying, I think I've heard this before. I, my response to that lovingly is, it, you need to hear it multiple times because my goal isn't for you just to hear and have a cognitive understanding. My goal lovingly as a shepherd is, how do I help you grow and take little steps in all of these core practices of Jesus? This isn't about Rick. This isn't about EFC. This isn't about the Western church. This is about you and Jesus. And I mean that in the most healthy way those core practices that are so needed in the way of Jesus. 
I've also learned that anything, anything can be a spiritual practice. Anything. <laughs> and and there's, these are the key that I think are, you know, the way that one author writes about this is he talks about this. Think of the main food groups, you know, in your diet. We think about a healthy diet to become healthy. These are the main ones. How many of you have ever even heard of Silence and Solitude? So I started bringing that up just two years ago. And it's one of the biggest patterns of Jesus. He often withdrew to be alone to commune with God in silence and solitude for mornings, for days, even one time 40 days. I remember starting this practice. I'm struggling with five minutes of it, and now I long for it. I love the first part of my day with coffee, and I get 15, 20 minutes alone in silence and solitude because that's a way of Jesus. It was a way for him to gain strength and to connect with his Father. Or prayer, not just talking at God. No relationship works that way. But as you develop silence and solitude, over time you begin to learn to maybe even hear from God. Maybe not an audible voice, but, but you begin to hear some of the things from God. Scripture and different manifestations and slowing down and formational reading we've talked a lot about. It's always been a practice of, of, of the church, of Jesus, through all these, these decades and centuries. Things like Sabbath, which we, in the Protestant movement, we, uh, we just ignore. We completely ignore it. And we wonder, why, we, just, we, we wonder why we are gassed and exhausted. And some of you retired people need to learn this. I listen to your schedules. I'm going, oh, my gosh. God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he, what? Rested. Why do you think you're better? Why do I think I'm better than him? You need rest. You need downtime. And it's one of the things we've talked about. You know, you know, just learning to refresh your soul with good food, quiet time, some sleep for your body, all these different things, communing with great people, loving God, loving others, any, all that. Those are some of the core practices. But anything, anything. I was watching my granddaughter the other day just walking around his walk, and she had a little tricycle. And I was just loving the way she was looking at life and the leaves and trees. And I mean, she's just stopping, wondering at, all, at it all. And I'm sitting there as a 56-year-old man. Why don't I wonder? anymore because it is beautiful the colors are gorgeous and it reminds me there's a creator God in the beginning Genesis God created Genesis is poetic literature it doesn't answer the how it simply answers the who God is the creator what makes something a spiritual practice connecting the gift to the giver having great food holding hands with your spouse or your fiancé, looking at them in love, or your kids watching them play basketball, and watching them grow because it happens quickly. And you revel at that. You, just, you connect the gift to the giver. That child is a gift from God to you and to all of this world. Anything. And so, so here's my application. I'll get you out of here. What I want you to do is this is the how now is I'd like you to identify and evaluate aspects of your rule of life. Is it getting your rule of life? You have one. You need to first identify it. Some of your rule of life is you're watching CNN or Fox two hours a day. Is it really forming you into becoming the person that you long to be in Jesus? Some of you, your rule of life is you're not getting enough sleep. You're go, 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 go. You have no time for silence and solitude, quiet time in the morning. Some people, when we work on this, and uh, emotional healthy spirituality, which is a slow down spirituality, oftentimes the midday practice of slowing down to be with God, to have that, is the hardest part. And yet somebody who's gotten there for years, it's the best part, one of the best parts of my day. Because I've learned God's not dependent on me to change this world. I'm not needed. <laughs> That is so freeing. Look at your aspects of your life. If you're working 70 hours a week, I get it. I, I was working 60 at some point. And I began to realize my, I was pushing that gas pedal on that car all the way down. If you know anything about cars, even the best of cars, if you hold that gas pedal all the way down for some length of time, you blow a gasket. I blew a few. Because one of my rules of life is you just keep trying harder. You just keep trying harder, Rick. 
You keep working at it. I've learned some things in life, it's not about you. It's about surrendering, and you give over to God, and you trust him with your life and the results in your life. So what are, and evaluate, is it working for you? Write down your desired rule of life. I mean, part of it, the goal. What kind of a person, when you're at 80 years of age, and this is what I love about this exercise, you start thinking about who you want to be at 80. What, here's another way of saying it. What are people going to say about you at your funeral? I know that's morbid. But it's beautiful at the same time. We don't think about this enough. Well, she was always going left and right. Boy, I remember trying to talk to her, but she was always, he was always at work, and all he could talk about was Trump. All she could talk about was Harris. All they could talk about, all this different stuff, and blah, blah, blah. And what is it? I want my kids to know they're the most important thing to me. Because at the end of the day, as much as I enjoy ministry, I love it. I mean, I love it, and, I, and I'm hoping to go for a long time. But the reality is, is one day I will step down. One day I will retire. And I love you all, but I don't think I'm going to retire with you all, right? I don't think you're going to come with me to Florida or Tanzania. Or actually, it's Costa Rica or the Maldives. Okay, back to reality, back to reality. Then take a couple of steps this week and month to work towards your desired rule of life. You just got to start making some changes. All right, let me give you mine, and then I'll get you out of here. Here's my one. I'm just going to shorten it, really. It's, it's long. For me, I, I do it in four different categories, God, others, myself, and my work. Do you want to write that down? It's, all, it's, it's in your notes. No, it's not in your notes. This part's not in your notes. This is just me. I'm sorry. So here's my four areas, God, others, myself, and work. And my rule of life is simply spending time daily, multiple times with God. Through silence and solitude, long out prayer, time in the word, and in the last year or so, incorporating Sabbath periods. From 38 years being a Christian, and I'm now incorporating Sabbath. It's taken decades. And you know what I'm, I'm going to tell you right now? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm thinking to myself, why did I do this before? Why did I do this before? I mean, I could bore, I mean, I just, anyhow, I just had a chunk of time on Friday, and it was just fantastic. Others, uh, number one is quality time with Donna. Every morning when she's home, she just left for a trip this morning. That's why she's not here. And we just have a routine. It's, it's just a rule of life. As I get up at 545, 6 a.m., that's so true, Kurt, online, it's not to impress anybody. It's just I'm older. I get up anyhow earlier. I love it, and I have, a, I have two places in my house. I love when the sun's not even up. I used to hate that, but now I love it because I have the house to myself. I get my coffee going. It has to be really good coffee with some good creamer, no sugar ever, and I just simply have that time with God. There's God. Donna will wake up later around 7, 7.30. She just sleeps different than I do. She'll come in, and we'll spend a half hour. Now, I know part of it is a stage of life. For the most part, we're empty now. But that is the favorite part of my day. She will then have her own time with God. I will go off to the gym. Because that's one of my rules of life is I have to work this old fat body five to six times a week. But there's also a rule of life because I've met some great people. And I love to influence. I love being influenced. I love the value of friendships, laughter, spiritual conversations. But she has her time. And then usually around dinner time, when, when we get to dinner time, we just talk about our day. I love connecting with her. We pray. We're now doing prayer walks after we eat dinner, something new that we've just incorporated. And we've had a great time doing that. We're making time for that. We try to get away at least two times a year um, to do just time alone together, uh, just date each other regularly. We do family, family, dinners weekly, Sundays, not this Sunday because we got other things going on, but pretty much every Sunday, later in the evening or sometimes in the afternoon, my kids all come over. They like us. They like each other. We did a lot of things wrong, but I think we've done some things right. Others, I like to mentor younger men, not because I have this wealth of knowledge, but because I wish somebody would have taken me a little bit more under their wing. And if I can have any value by simply mentoring, by loving and encouraging you, I'll try to do that. I've got friends. I've got a lot of friends. I'm an extrovert. Others, myself, it includes all the above. It means eating healthy. Trying to go six days a week, it's more like four days a week. And you men keep on planning things at Buffalo Wild Wings for fantasy football. I can't accomplish that rule of life. So it's your fault, no, no personal responsibility whatsoever. 
I try to work out five to six times a week. I've learned as I'm older, I need seven to eight hours of sleep. I'm learning that I need more rest. I love to read. At the same time, too, I love laughter. And so what I do is a rule of life. I shared this with you before. I will, actually, I will actually watch, at the end of my day, funny shows. Don't judge me, but I have funny shows. The Office just cracks me up. I love laughter. Seinfeld, oh my gosh. Big Bang Theory. Because I just love to laugh. Because laughter, Scripture teaches, is medicine for the what? The soul. Um, I get to eat work. I want to be, be a praying pastor. I've, part of this is a reaction to the modern contemporary church movement, which I was a part. Bigger is better. It's all about getting more butts in your chairs. Um, and, and again, my motivation was good. I thought at the time it was good. But ultimately, this big, big church movement has an underbelly, has an underside, a shadow side to it. And you become more like a CEO, organizing business and structure and business plans and all those different things. I understand as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that whole thing led me down to a demise. I felt like a failure. I felt like a worthless piece of, you know, I just, everything. My whole life began to unravel because what I thought I was supposed to be, who I thought I was supposed to be, doing all the right things, I thought for all the right reasons, I learned there was a shadow side to me through spiritual direction, mentoring, silence and solitude, and even some Christian counseling. And so as a pastor, I've been working on a different rule of life. And I want to pray for people. I want to know what's going on in people's world. That's why I'm asking you, fill out those prayer cards, those connect cards. I'm not just saying that because I'm supposed to say that as the pastor at a church. Hey, fill out your prayer card. I want to pray for you. Forgive me if I don't remember your name. Sometimes I'm getting older. But I am fiercely trying to pray for you more and more. I'm trying to stop and make sure I talk to people, listen to people, as well as lead lovingly with the right heart. That's what this is about. And then the one last thing. By the fourth century, the church was a phenomenon. This band of oppressed peasants had grown and grown, so much so that finally the Emperor Constantine, the most powerful man on the planet of the Empire of Rome, named Christianity the official religion of the world. Out with the Greek gods, out with pretending Caesar was divine. It seemed like this was an outstanding victory for the church. But over time, it drew a death blow to Christianity. It always has if you understand your church history. Because there's an obvious pattern in church history that the people of God always, always thrive in the worst of conditions. But when the church buddies up with worldly power, it actually becomes spiritually powerless. So the church that suddenly could not be stopped in the 4th century became so watered and diluted down just a few decades after Constantine, making it the official religion of the empire, Rome, began to give up or give have these appetites where the world crept into the lives of believers. Back then, power, wealth, and control until they began to tell a different story, choose new routines, until they began to sing different so- uh, songs. All that, many thought in the 5th century, you read the work, they thought Christianity was about to die in their lifetimes. Why? Because the church was no longer getting into the empire. The empire was getting into the church. And folks, that is our story today. And the church did not bottom out, though, in the 5th century. There was life breathed back into her. A community was revived, and the potency of the Jesus way was preserved because here we are today. What turned the tide? A few ordinary people, radicals, walked off into the desert, and they returned to the core practices of Jesus. Like silence and solitude, deep prayer lives, the word, and we know them today as the desert fathers and mothers. What an incredible gift. And they walked off into the desert to stare down the idols of their day and to allow the Holy Spirit to form them, to form them into a prophetic contradiction to the ways of the world. The result was not immediate church. It was slow, but over time, lives were so compelling, people began to move out into the desert to learn the ways, rule of life, and then they began to move back in their communities. 
And this has been happening all throughout church history, and I can bore you of all the movements in church history where this happened. And you will find a rule of life is at the heartbeat of saints from every per, uh, persuasion, every tradition throughout Christian history, counterformation, setting up the counter the idols of their day, where people said, this will not happen on my watch. Just normal people like you and me, so committed to being with Jesus, to become more like Jesus, to set up their lives, a vow not to earn God's love, but because they already bask in God's love and grace, is to make sure that they are living out lives, loving God and loving people. The command in which Jesus said is the most important and how you summarize all of the Scripture. And this series, long series this winter, this past winter and spring, is the rediscovering of how to live the easy yoke of Jesus. And it's simply this, an invitation to live with Jesus, to be with Jesus. Living under a rule of life. Experiment, you have freedom, go for it. And I'm willing to say, this is what I'm devoted to. And it's more needed than ever. Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the so many of men and women who, Lord, would not sell out to the idols of their day. And as I know a little bit now of church history, it wasn't people like me. It was just normal men, women, young and old of every persuasion of Christian tradition, of every ethnicity, of every socioeconomic status, Lord. But what seems to be a common thread is people who took a vow, a rule of life, to make you the priority to build their lives upon. We live in a world where we have forgotten that. And even... Sadly, a Christian world that has forgotten about that. We far much rely too much on people like me. People, and we live off of other spirituality. I did for years. Help us. I pray for each person here, those online, to just take small steps. You love them. You just want to enjoy being with them. It's slow, but it's so well worth it. That, has you, that is how you continue to change a life at a time, a marriage at a time, a family at a time, a community at a time, a nation and a world all throughout history. May we vow to you our very lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? God bless you all. Have a great rest of the week. Next week, we start a new three-week series called Women of the Bible. Looking forward to that. Last but not least, go Bears. You're dismissed.